Well, good morning, Bell Shoals. It is good to be with you. My name is Ben Skog. I am the pastor of missions and pastoral care here at the Brandon campus. And it's a delight to be able to be with you this morning to open up the Word of God. And before we do that, uh, I, I need to ask you the same question that we started with uh, the last time I was here, and that is this. Are you ready to encounter the living God through His Word? Again, the promise of Isaiah 55 holds true. Every time that the Word of God is rightly divided, then the living God, the God who spoke this world into existence with a mere word, is going, His will is going to pass. It's going to come to pass in my life and in your life. And God is going to use this preached word this morning to speak to those areas in our life in which we know we need help and even those areas in which we aren't thinking of this morning. Are you ready to encounter the God of the universe? Then let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are the one true living God and there is no other. We thank you that you have given us your word and Lord, we ask right now that you would be with me this morning as your preacher. Help me to rightly divide your word, to proclaim it with truth, passion, love, compassion. And Lord, help all of us. May your Holy Spirit be working inside every single one of us this morning, opening up our spiritual eyes and spiritual ears, speaking to us, working in our lives in a way that only you can. Lord, help us. Prepare our hearts right now as we open up your word and we watch you transform us. And Lord, we promise, we promise that we will never rob you of your glory, but we will praise you and praise you with every breath that you give to us. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Please turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5 is where we're going to be this morning. We're going to be looking at verses 27 through 32. And in the first service, we only got to verse 28. So when I say 32, that might be a little bit pie in the sky. But we're going to get as far as we can. And this story is a story concerning a man named Levi. Now, Levi is Matthew. So Matthew is his Hebrew name. So because most of us know him by Matthew, when we go through this story this morning, I'm not going to say Levi, I'm going to say Matthew because they're, they're the same person. But before I do that, the last time I was with you, I, I introduced you to my mom, to a woman named Lois. And I walked you through a few snapshots of Lois's life. And, and, and here's the thing, you, you can call her Lois, but I can't. She's still alive and right, she's still able enough to beat me. So if I call her Lois instead of mom, I'm, I'm in trouble. I also told you about my stepdad. His name's Joe Skog. And I told you that he and my mom married when I was about two and a half years old and that all of a sudden we became a mixed family of seven. Mom and stepdad, Joe, and then five kids of which I was the youngest. And here's the beautiful thing. By God's grace, that divorce that happened in, in, in my mom's life and in my stepdad's life brought together something that only God could paint a beautiful portrait of uh, because my entire life, this man Joe, who society calls my stepdad, and I would be his stepson, did you know I never once doubted his love for me? And, and, and as a stepchild, right, I, I, I didn't deserve that love, but yet he gave it to me. There was never a moment in my life where I doubted his love for me, and so I will no longer call him stepdad. He's my dad. And there were two occasions, and I, and I hope none of my uh, siblings are watching this morning because this actually happened on two occasions, that, that Joe Skog said, son. Now let that just sink in for a moment. Son, stepdad, his stepson, son. He said, dads are not allowed to have favorites. But if they were, he said, you would be mine. There was never a moment in my life where I doubted his love up until he passed away two years ago. But one of the most beautiful moments in my life that was a demonstration of his love for me was on my 18th birthday when he legally adopted me. You see, he legally had my name changed, so I went from Ben Edders to Ben Skog. And that morning, there were four of us in the courtroom. There was me, there was my dad who has given me his name, and there was my oldest brother, Bruce, who's an attorney. 
And he's the one who did all the forms and all the paperwork for these proceedings. And then there was the judge. And after all the legal stuff had gone on and, and, and the judge had pronounced me to be Ben Skog at that moment, he said words to me that I will never forget for the rest of my life. He looked at me down from where he was and he said, son, he said, today you have been given a great name. This com in this community, he said the name Skog means something. It has a great reputation. It has, has a high value attached to it. And the name that you have been bestowed upon today, Skog, may you spend the rest of your lives living up to that great name, the name that you have been given, not because you deserved it, but because this man bestowed it upon you. Live up to that name. I'll never forget those words, and it, it reminds me of my first adoption. You see, I've been adopted twice. The first adoption happened when I was 12 years old. You see, that's the, that's the year in which I gave my life to Jesus Christ in saving faith. You see, the word is very clear. It says that at the moment that you exercise your faith, that faith which Ephesians 2 says is a gift from God given to you, it's not something we muster up. It's not something we deserve. It is a gift from God given to you so that you might express that faith. Express it. Express that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior of your life and repent of your sins. The Word of God says at the moment that you and I express saving faith in Jesus Christ, that at that moment you and I have been adopted. Adopted by God Most High, the God, the Creator of all things. The one who is sovereign, the one who holds all authority in the palm of his hands has adopted you. The word says God the Father has adopted us through God the Son, Jesus Christ. So friends, if you're a believer this morning, you too have been adopted. Adopted by God. We move from a human being being made in the image of God to be able to call God my heavenly Father. And he sees each one of us in faith, those who are believers. And he calls us, you are my son. You are my daughter in Christ. But the word of God says something else, too. It says that he gives us a new name. Do you know what that name is? It's not Skog. It's not Edders. It's not Thompson. It's Christian. It's Christian. Every single one of us who have been adopted by God, have been given a new name. And the name upon you this morning as a believer is Christian. Do you know what the name Christian means? Little Christ. Little Christ. So friends, this morning, you too are supposed to hear that voice from our Heavenly Father. And it says this, Son, Daughter, you have been given a new name. You have been adopted by me through Jesus Christ. And I bestowed upon you a new name. And may you, may you spend the rest of your life living up to the name that has been given to you by grace. This morning we are going to walk through the calling of Matthew. And in this, you're going to see him move from Sinner, human being made in the image of God, rebelling against God. You're going to see that. And then you're going to see him called, called, summoned forth by Christ. And then you're going to see by grace, not only was he called, but then by the power of God, you're going to see how his transformed life begins to change. And we're going to see it all. Look with me in verse 27. First off, the first three words, at least in the New American Standard from which I'm using this morning, the first three words say, and, or sorry, after that, comma, he. After that, he. So the minute we see those three words, we have to ask ourselves, after what? And the he makes us say, who? So after what, who? What the author is doing is he's connecting this passage. He's saying you cannot possibly understand in its full complexity the calling of Matthew unless you first remember the verses that go before it. And in this case, it's verses 17 through 26. And there we are introduced to Jesus. He's in the town of Capernaum, his hometown, and he's carrying out his healing ministry, a teaching ministry. And the Word of God tells us that he is inside of a house, and that house is jam-packed. And not only is he there, but also uh, the foil of the story. The scribes and Pharisees are there as well. Now, we do know that some of the scribes and Pharisees came to saving faith, but the majority of them are his enemies. 
They are without question there to trap him, to trick him with his words, at least to, to try to do so. They are the foil of the story. But the word of God also introduces us to five other people. Four men and then another man who is a paralytic. And the word of God says that these men want to get this paralytic in front of Jesus so that he might with a word or with a touch heal this man from his paralysis. But of course the house is too crowded. And so they, 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 they go up onto the roof of the house, they remove some of the tiles from the roof, and they lower this man who cannot move. He's, he's paralyzed. They lower this man on his mat down in front of Jesus. And there the word of God says, seeing their faith, plural, he says to the one, your sins are forgiven. Now, friends, let's not get confused here. We all know that we have to have individual sin. My, my faith, or sorry, individual faith. My faith cannot save my wife. My faith cannot save my daughter. My parents' faith cannot save me. All of us have to have our own individual, authentic, saving faith. Your faith this morning cannot save your husband or your wife. Your faith cannot save your son or your daughter. All of us have to have individual faith given as a gift to us by God and to express it. And by the way, this passage does not contradict that. It's not saying he looks at these four men and says, your faith is going to save that person. He's looking collectively at all five, and he's seeing that their faith in him has been displayed by the amount of effort they've gone to to bring this paralyzed man in front of Christ. So he's saying, I see the saving faith in all five of you. But then he turns his attention to the individual and says, your sins are forgiven. Here comes the foil. Scribes and the Pharisees begin to reason within themselves and to grumble. And they say two things, two statements here. One of them is right and one of them is wrong. The first one, they say, who is this fellow who is blaspheming? Then the second statement is this, because who can forgive sins but God alone? They have seen Jesus look at this man and say, your sins are forgiven. And they make one right statement. They say, there is no one who can forgive sins except for God alone. In that statement, they are right. Only God can forgive sins. Here's where they're wrong. They had the right theology, but they misapplied its truth. You see that first statement that they made. Who is this fellow who blasphemes? In other words, they looked at him and they said, only God can forgive sins. Truth. And then they assumed that he was not fully God. And that's where they make their mistake. The word of God here in this passage is screaming at us. You have to know the full identity of Christ. That in Christ, this is one person with two natures. In his divine nature, he is fully God. In his divine nature, he is God the Son. He is eternal. He is, there has never been a moment in his divine nature in which he was not. There was never a moment in which in his divine nature he didn't exist. He is exactly the same as God the Father and God the Spirit. Same infinite knowledge, same infinite power, same infinite love, same infinite compassion, same infinite holiness. Everything that God is, Christ is in his divine nature. Which means he's infinite in his holiness, infinite in his righteousness, infinite in his justice. And he is the God who is able to forgive sins in his divine nature. And in the Trinity, there is the plan of God, the eternal plan of God, to come up with a plan, just one plan, not two plans, not five plans, not seven plans, just one plan in which the God of infinite holiness and infinite love can bring about the forgiveness of sins. And here's God's plan, that God would take something unclean, sinners, those who are rebels against God, unclean things, and he would allow a substitute of a clean thing. And that the unclean thing would take the sins of itself and impute it to the, to the clean thing. And that the clean thing would then receive the sins of the unclean thing. And furthermore, that's not, that's not it. That furthermore, then the clean thing would take his righteousness. Do you know how you get righteousness? It's earned. 
Scripture says you and I can't earn it because we're sinners. We'll get to that in just a minute. But there's one who is perfect. And the Word of God says that not only does the clean thing take the sins of the unclean thing, but then takes his obedience, his earned righteousness, and gives it to the unclean thing. And that substitution cleanses the unclean thing so that the unclean thing moves from clean, unclean thing to clean thing. And that's where we pick up the second nature of Christ. In his divine nature, he is fully God. Omniscient, omnipresent, infinite in holiness, infinite in power, infinite in compassion, infinite in love, infinite in holiness, and is able to forgive sins in his divine nature. And then we look down in verse 24, and he makes, these, makes this statement. He says, but so that you will know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins here on earth. He performs this miracle. And what this is supposed to remind us of is that not only is Jesus Christ utterly unique in that in his divine nature, he's fully God, infinite in all that God is. But at the incarnation, that thing that you and I celebrate at Christmas, God the Son takes on a second nature, and it's a human nature. And now, at that moment, he is forever the God-man, fully God in his divine nature. And in his human nature, he is fully man, but yet without sin. And as the Son of Man, he is the one who has been sent forth from God to go out as the good shepherd and search for lost sheep, broken sheep. Sheep who have made mistakes, sheep who have wandered far from God. And it's his job to go out and seek for them and to find them and to be their substitute, heal them up, hold them fast, make them and turn them from unclean to clean. After that, he, now that we understand who Christ is, fully God in his divine nature, the son of man who is going to be the perfect substitute for all believers is now on a divine mission to go out and to search for and to find and to change, to save and transform lost sheep. With that in mind, after that, he, meaning Jesus, the good shepherd, is now looking on his mission, his divine mission. He is looking for lost sheep. And there he gets up, the word of God says, and he sees a man named Levi. We'll call him Matthew, a tax collector seated at a booth. Let's focus on that word he saw. In, in the New American Standard it says, and Jesus noticed. I get it, that word does fall short a little bit. In, e, in, the, in ESV, the English Standard Version, it said, and he saw that, that is true, but it doesn't pick up the full force of the word. You see what is, that word is saying is he, he's not walking along and says, oh, there's Matthew over the side. That's not it. He is on a divine mission to seek and save his lost sheep. And here he finds one. That word does not say he noticed. It doesn't say merely he saw. It says, and he looked intently at Matthew. The question is, what did he see? What did he see? The word says... But he looked and he saw a man named Levi, a man named Matthew, seated at a tax collector's booth. Why? Because he is a tax collector. Now, here's where we have to make a distinction. You see, our society looks at certain things and calls them sin. Well, I'm not sure our society, which is fallen and broken, calls anything sin. But they say certain things are taboo. And the same held true for this society. See, in Israel at this time, because they were underneath the yoke of slavery from Rome, Rome was charging them taxes on everything. And what Rome would do is they would hire out franchises of tax collection agencies to a chief tax collector, like Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector. And then that chief tax collector would hire other smaller tax collectors like Matthew. So someone like Matthew would have been hired by a Zacchaeus who was hired by Rome. And it was expected that not only would, the, would this tax collector collect taxes from the Jewish people, but that he would line his own pockets by charging extra at every, at every possible uh, turn so that he would become wealthy through this entire operation. And because of that, the Jewish society looked at a tax collector and said, you are a sinner. In fact, in some of the Jewish writings called Talmuds, they said that a tax collector was beyond redemption. What they mean is that that person's beyond God's grace. 
beyond God's grace, that this person who is a tax collector because he's a traitor to the nation cannot be redeemed. That once you go there, there's no coming back. I just hold that off to the side for a second. It's easy for you and I to say, well, you know, <laughs> I don't like tax collectors. I don't like IRS. If I see that envelope from an IRS agent, I just assume something bad is going to happen. But beyond redemption, I don't think any of us think that. But hold on. You see, there's a little bit of Pharisee inside each one of us, isn't there? Because every single one of us right now, if I asked you, is there a category of person who has committed such and such and such a sin that you would have a very hard time thinking that God could love that person? Let's, let's pretend for a minute here that all of a sudden we received news this week that throughout all the maximum security prisons in the world, and let's, let's be honest for a minute about it, the type of person who is inside a maximum security, whether it's a men's prison or a women's prison, let's assume for a moment that these prisons are filled with murderers, with rapists, with child molesters, the worst of the worst. What if we heard that massive revival have broken out in those places. What would our hearts say? Some of us would have a hard time. Some of us would say, well, wait a minute, if you've done that to someone else, God, are you sure? God, are you sure that you want to save that one and that one and that one, knowing what they've done? That's from society's perspective. And God doesn't operate by what society says is what. He operates from his own standard of judgment. You see, the word of God says this, that every single sin is actually against God. It might be aimed at someone else. The other person might be the recipient of said sin. But scripture says, David says, that all sin is ultimately against God. You see, all sin is a violation of the summary of the commandments, which is this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And all sin, whether it's murder, whether it's theft, whether it's adultery, whether it's lust, whether it's coveting, all of it, all of it is a violation of those two commandments because those two commandments are connected. If you claim to love God with all your heart, soul, and strength, guess how you'll demonstrate it? By loving your neighbor as yourself. And when we cheat our neighbor, when we defraud our neighbor, in the eyes of God, it's proof that you don't love God. The horizontal is connected to the vertical. Now, let's define sin for just a moment, knowing that all sin is ultimately against God. Let's define it. Sin in Scripture is defined like this. Sin is any failure to perfectly. Let that settle in. Any failure to perfectly perfectly obey God in action, thought, emotion, or nature, which Scripture calls our hearts. We understand that sin is carried out in the, in the deeds of the body, in actions. We, 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 we get that if someone murders someone else, that person is sinning by their actions. We understand that when it almost doesn't need to be defended. What about thoughts? Did you know that that last commandment in, in, in Scripture says, do not covet. Friends, you don't covet here. You don't covet with your legs. You covet right here with your mind. Which is why Paul says, take every thought captive. Why? Because God holds us accountable for our thoughts. Every one of our thoughts. He says, you are renewed. How? By the transformation, the renewal of your mind. That's why he says, take every thought captive. Because God holds us accountable to our thoughts. Furthermore, our emotions... Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, if you fail to love God and love your brother as yourself, what are you guilty of? Hatred. And if you're guilty of hatred as an emotion, you're guilty of murder, he says. And finally, not only are we held accountable for our actions, our thoughts, and our emotions, we're held accountable to our very fallen sin nature. The Word of God in Genesis 6-5 says this, it says God looks down and he sees the intention of every single person's heart. Heart is the word in Scripture for nature. You see, your nature drives everything else. Your nature drives your emotions, your nature drives your thoughts, and your nature drives your action. Summed up in the word heart. Heart. 
He says, every single intention and thought and desire of man's heart is evil continually. Therefore, he sends the global flood. So let me say this, friends. Before you and I look at other people and say, God, how can you save that one? And how can you save that one? How can you love that one? How can you give grace on that one? The first thing we should do is understand that the word of God says, none of us are righteous. All of us have fallen short. So the first question should be, Lord, how can you, uh, it shouldn't be, Lord, how dare you save them, but it should be, God, how can you save me? I know my heart. I am above all things wicked. Paul himself says, I am the chief of all sinners. God, I know how I have rebelled against you. Some of you this morning are, are thinking to yourself, there's a category of person that, that I don't want to see in heaven. In between services, I, I heard stories about people who have been harmed by other people, raped, molested. And sometimes my, in the hardness of my heart, I say, God, are you sure you want to save that one? And here's the beautiful thing. When Jesus calls Matthew and he calls others, and the word of God says he is friend of tax collectors and sinners, it's a reminder to us that none of us are beyond his infinite grace. That the God who is infinite in his grace, he bestows it upon sinners. He bestows it upon rebels who have done horrific things to other people, and yet God of his infinite grace, infinite compassion, infinite love says, Christ says, I will stand in for you. Not only stand in for, I will take those sins in which you have carried out to other people, and I will place them upon myself as though I carried them out. No one in this room is beyond the power of God's infinite grace. Some of you this morning are on the flip side. Some of you have been on the receiving end of those atrocities. In a room this size, we all know the statistics hold true. There are people who have had horrific things done to them. And maybe this morning you are someone who was abused. And maybe this morning you're saying, God, I, am, I don't feel clean. God, I, I, I've had these things done to me, and, and, and in my own mind, I don't deserve your grace or your mercy because I am unclean. And I'm here to tell you that when Christ calls you and he summons you and he takes your sin upon himself and he gives you his righteousness, he's cleansing you beyond anything that we could possibly imagine. So you don't sit there as someone who is so dirty that you're beyond his grace, his love, his perfection. He gladly gives it to you. There is no one in this room who is beyond and outside of his grace, mercy, and love. That's why it's called grace. Because I don't deserve it. And neither do you. Here's what I deserve. The word of God says none of us are righteous except Christ. And that the wages of sin is what? Death. That's what I deserve. That's what you deserve. And yet Christ in his infinite mercy, his infinite grace comes and he sees Matthew and he sees the sin. And what he's saying when he calls Matthew is this, in three years from now, Matthew, I'm going to be on that cross as the son of man and I'm going to take your sins, your cheating, your failures, and I'm going to place them upon myself and I will bear the wrath of God for you so that you do not have to. And then I'm going to give you my righteousness. So in the eyes of God, you are fully justified, forgiven of sins, and declared perfectly righteous. Because there is none outside of the amazing, infinite, unfathomable grace of God in Jesus Christ. Which is why he is able to say at the end of verse 27, follow me, follow me. 
You see, this is not merely a suggestion. This is not merely uh, a suggestion saying, hey, if you don't have anything better, uh, go ahead and, and leave the tax booth and follow me. This is the summons of the one true living God, God the Son. This is the summons of the King of kings and Lord of lords saying to you and to Matthew and to me, follow after me because I am willing to be the substitute for you. I will take your sin, I will take your shame upon myself, and I will gladly face the wrath of God for you. And I will cleanse you. I will give you my perfect righteousness. Follow me. Friends, I need to be reminded of that. Because if we're not careful, if we're not careful, a little bit of the hardness of the heart will creep in to every single one of our hearts. And we will look at a group of people, whether they be on the street corner, whether they be asking for change, whether, they, whether we see them on the news, and we'll assume, just like the Pharisee, we'll say, God, are you sure that you want to save that one? None of us are beyond God's infinite grace. And notice this, not only are we saved by God's grace, but let's see how the power of God, his infinite power then moves us from saving us to transforming us and changing us. You see, God does not change us to sit. Just as none of us are outside of his grace, mercy, and compassion, none of us are called just to sit. Are we called to sit here this morning and to hear the word of God and to worship with one another? Absolutely. But then we are called to be the A-team, called to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ, the salt and light that goes out into this world to carry on the mission of the good shepherd Jesus Christ. And none of that is done in our own power. Just as we're saved by God's grace, so too God's infinite power changes us in the blink of an eye. You see in verse 28, the word of God shows Matthew who has now been saved by God's grace. It shows that he got up and he forsook everything. He left it all behind and began to follow Christ. And then he used his own resources to throw a party for Christ. And he invites the very people that he used to sin with so that they too might become saved as he was. Where does that come from? It doesn't come from you. It doesn't come from me. It comes from the power of God and what's called regeneration. We call it this, born again. You know, at the moment that God gives you saving faith and we express that saving faith to God, not only does he adopt us, but we are now born again. We have a new nature, a new heart. Scripture says he takes that old heart that old heart, and he removes that heart of stone and he replaces it with a heart of flesh. That's our new nature. And in this nature, we move from someone who is dead in sins and trespasses, chained under the bondage of sin, not able to please God, the book of Romans 8, 6 says, to now an adopted child, son or daughter of God most high through Jesus Christ. And he gives us that power because he makes us a new creation. Did you know every time we see someone baptized over here, baptism doesn't save us, but it's a very important picture of being a new creation in Christ. You see, that water is supposed to resemble death. It's supposed to remember the burial ground of death. And when the person goes under the water, what we're saying is the old man is dead. Old Ben is dead beneath the waters. Dead. And because he has saving faith in Jesus Christ, he is united to Christ. And when he is raised, just as Christ was raised from the dead, he is raised as a new creation in Christ. And that picture in front of a room full of witnesses is saying, I am no longer who I used to be. By the power of God, the grace of God, I've been saved. And from this moment on, because I've been adopted by God the Father through Christ, I would have spent every moment, what? living up to that name that God has bestowed upon me as Christian. All by the power of God. God makes us born again, and he gives us that power so that Matthew says, and he got up and he forsook. He walked away from this lucrative business called being a tax collector. He walked away from the life that killed him in bondage and sin and shame. And he was able to leave it knowing that he can never go back. We understand after the death of Christ that Peter, James, and John, they went back to fishing. But you can't go back to the, to the job of a tax collector. He cannot go back. There is no turning back. It's just like Cortez when he said, burn the boats behind us. There is no turning back. 
And he does that by the power of God. The power of God, the same power that resurrected Christ, is now in you, adopted brother and sister. It's in you, son and daughter of God most high, so that you can walk away from those sins that used to hold you in bondage to those addictions that are holding you in bondage right now. Christ in his infinite power, his unending power, has severed those things for us so that you and I don't have to live like we used to be. And because Christ, Christ in his mercy has saved us by grace and has given us the power, you and I now have the ability to obey and we have the ability to sin. But let's be honest with ourselves about when we choose sin, friend. We're no longer bound to it like we were before we were saved. The hard part about sin now is that every time we choose sin over obedience, what we're saying to God in that moment is this, I love my sin more than I love you. I love my sin more than I love you. And friends, it doesn't have to be that way. Is this life of what we call sanctification, is it a struggle? Yes. Do we fail? Yes. But our hearts cry every single morning should be, Lord, don't, my goal shouldn't be, may I not sin today. My goal should be because I love you and your word says, those who love me will what? Obey me. My heart's cry shouldn't be, keep me from failing. My heart's cry every day should be, God, in your infinite power. You are the one who spoke the world into existence, and your power is coursing through me by the power of the Holy Spirit. Help me to obey you, to demonstrate my love for you. Help me to forsake those things I need to forsake. Lord, by your grace and your power, break those chains which hold me. Help me not crawl back to the quagmire of sin. Help me to use those things that you have given to me like Matthew has. Help me to use those things that you are momentarily putting in my possession. They don't belong to me. Everything that God has given to us is here with open hands. May I use those things for your glory. Take everything that I have, because it's not mine, it's yours. It's just on loan to me for a second. May I never be like the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler is a story that's opposite of Matthew. You see, here's a man who's so blinded by his own sin that he says to Jesus, what must I do to enter eternal life? And Jesus gives him the, he says, obey the commandments. And what's the summation of the commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And the blind fool, the blind fool thinks that he's done it. And he says, all these things I've done since I was a youth, blind as can be. So Jesus says, how about this? I'm going to prove to you I'm going to prove to you that you don't have your things. Your things have you. Go, sell everything you have and give to the poor. What would that be a demonstration of? Loving your neighbor as yourself. And he walked away because he was an exceedingly rich man. He neither loved God with all his heart, soul, and strength, and neither did he love his neighbor as himself. And his actions demonstrated it. Friends, may everything we have, may we know that God has lent us these things and we hold them with open hands and say, God, anything that I have, use them for your glory because they're not mine. They're yours. And by the power of God, by the grace of God, may you use these things to glorify yourself. So Lord, if you need me to, to go to Riverview for the next several months, may it be. Lord, if you need me or you're calling me to, to start a disciples group or, or, or to join a life group, Lord, may it be, but use all my talents, all my treasures, which you're giving to me on loan. May I turn back to you and rightly reflect you in your glory, your love, your compassion. And may I join you as your hands and feet, your salt and light as we go out into this world on the mission of Jesus Christ, which is what? To seek and save. Friends, none of us are outside of God's grace. Do you know that this morning? Do you know that? 
And do you know that now that you have been saved, he is giving you power to walk away from the things that are holding you up. There's a word, words of a song that brings tears to my eyes every time I see it. And the song is called, All I Have is Christ. Because that's all we have, isn't it? That's all we have. Hear the words. I once was lost in darkest night. Weren't we all? Yet I thought I knew the way. There's that prideful heart. The sin that promised joy and life held me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to your will. And if you had not loved me first, I would refuse you still. But as I ran my hell-bound race, indifferent to the cost. You looked upon my helpless state and you led me to the cross. And I beheld God's love displayed. You suffered in my place. You bore the wrath reserved for me and now all I know is grace. Hallelujah. All I have is Christ. Hallelujah. Jesus is my life. Now, Lord, I would be yours alone and live so that all might see the strength to follow your commands could never come from me. Oh, Father, use my ransom life in any way you choose and let my soul forever be because my only boast is you. All we have is Christ. All we need. Christ. Why? Because Christ